Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in Junior English. We turn now in your hymnals to page 1341 and following Lee Young Lee's offering, The Gift. Uh, let's read a little bit about him. You can see that uh, Lee was uh, born in 1957. Um, Lee Young Lee was born in Indonesia after his parents were exiled from China. Indonesia proved equally unwelcoming to Lee's father, who was both Christian and pro-Western, and he was imprisoned for 19 months. After his release, the family moved first to Hong Kong, then traveled through Macau and Japan. Finally, in 64, Lee and his family moved to the United States. The next heading, Landing in America. After a childhood of constant motion, Lee adjusted to a calm life in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. As an 11-year-old boy, he met a young woman who would later become his wife and the inspiration for many of his poems. Although Lee's transition to life in the United States was smooth, he still says he's unable to decide if he should consider himself Chinese, Chinese-American, Asian-American, or American. The search for identity is a reoccurring theme throughout his work. Although his father often read poetry aloud, Lee did not begin writing poetry until he was a student at the University of Pittsburgh. After further studies in Arizona and New York, Lee settled in Chicago, where he continues to live and work as a full-time poet. Over the years, he's published a number of poetry collections and other works. Final heading, story poems. Lee's poems are known for their meandering free verse style and for the complex web of memories they present. Many of his story poems focus on his childhood experiences as an immigrant and the son of exiles, often recalling with affection the strength and gentleness of his father. Influenced by both the Bible and classic Chinese poets, Lee's works have a silent, reverent quality that gives even his most personal subject matter a universal appeal. His many awards include a Lenin Literary Award, a Winning Writers Award, three Pushcart Prizes, and the Gunningheim Foundation Fellowship. I like the quote there on 1341, the knowledge that it takes to write a poem gets burnt up in the writing of the poem. It's an interesting line. Let's now turn to this poem on 1342-1343, The Gift. And let's just read along. Read with me. And uh, at level one, when we finish, we're going to ask, what is the experience of this poem? Like, what exactly is happening in this poem? Let's see if you can, if, if you can figure it out. The gift. To pull the metal splinter from my palm, my father recited a story in a low voice. I watched his lovely face and not the blade. Before the story ended, he'd removed the iron sliver I thought I'd die from. I can't remember the tale, but hear his voice still, a well of dark water, a prayer. And I recall his hands, two measures of tenderness he laid against my face, the flames of discipline he raised above my head. Had you entered that afternoon, you would have thought you saw a man planting something in a boy's palm, a silver tear, a tiny flame. If you followed that boy, you would have arrived here, where I bend over my wife's right hand. Look how I shave her thumbnail down so carefully she feels no pain. Watch as I lift the splinter out. I was seven when my father took my hand like this, and I did not hold that shard between my fingers and think, metal that will bury me, christen it little assassin or going deep for my heart. And I did not lift up my wound and cry, death visited here. I did what a child does when he's given something to keep. I kissed my father. Now this is of course a poem, as we read in our, in our um, biography about Lee Young Lee, that will move from a, an experience of childhood to an experience that's now in adulthood and then back again to the very end. The, the, the way this poem is crafted is quite brilliant. But let's begin at level one. Just jot down what happens in this poem quite literally. Right? What is it that specifically happens? The answer, of course, is that at the age of seven, as a little boy, his father took a splinter out of his hand, out of his palm. Later, of course, the speaker in the poem is doing the exact same thing with his wife. And in the process of taking a splinter out of his wife's palm, or thumb, 
he is reminded of the experience when he was a little boy. We should point out just for a moment, and Wordsworth, the great British ro uh, romantic poet, was very attuned to this, how compelling it is that so many of the experiences we have in our youth don't really come to full fruition and importance for us until we are older, as we are now, so that we begin to have these kind of experiences where we go, oh yeah, this thing that I'm doing, that's something that I can remember being done to me when I was a little kid. Uh, recently, a student of mine is reporting she's uh, coaching little kids volleyball and remembered for the first time that she was once one of those little kids. So it's like everything comes full circle and you have that experience in this poem. Of course, the question at level 2A, though, will be, what's up with the title, The Gift? And that will maybe require a bit more closer study for us. So let's, let's go through the stanzas of the poem really quickly and kind of exegete as we go. Opening stanza. To pull the metal splinter from my palm, my father recited a story in a low voice. I watched his lovely face and not the blade. Telling you that, of course, you had to, he had to use the knife, right? A blade to be able to get right, the, uh, the splinter, the metal splinter out. Before the story ended, ended, he'd remove the iron sliver I thought I'd die from. So jot down really quickly at level one, what is it that he's saying here about how this unfolded? He's a little boy, he's got this metal splinter in his palm, he's kind of freaking out. Hey, let's point this out though. When the father takes the splinter with a knife out of the boy's palm, what does the father do that's kind of interesting? Well, we're told he recites a story in a low voice. Now, there's two things interesting here. Jot them down. First of all, why a low voice? Why not a loud voice? What's he trying to do? Right, trying to calm the emotions, right? The little boy, we're told, thought he would die from this. He's freaking out, right? But of course, when you're seven years old and an adult pulls out a big knife blade, see some of you will jump to 3B really quickly and go, oh yeah, I've had this experience as a kid when my old man pulled out a huge knife blade and he was gonna like fix my problem but it looked like he was gonna cut my hand off or something. And maybe some of you grew up in a house with people who love to joke and, they're, and they maybe said something like, well, looks like you're done for. We might as well just take the hand off now. Let's get out the knife and do it. And of course, maybe you freaked out and then they were like, no, 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 I'm kidding. What is, what is with the verb recite? My father recited a story. John, tell me what you think is going on there. This is really a very subtle observation that the poet is making here about the ways in which parents tell stories that they know that quite possibly they were told as well. Do you see what I'm saying? In other words, it's almost like heritage of a kind, where the stories that get translated are often stories from an earlier time. And so he's telling the boy a story. Now question, why would he tell the boy a story to take out the metal splinter? And obviously, there are a number of answers, but one clear answer here is, well, he wants to teach the boy something. Or what's the title of the poem? Uh, he wants to give the boy something, right? In the extracting of the metal shard, he, of course, is doing something that dads have to do. But in the giving of the story to the boy, he's planting something. We'll come back to this word picture in a bit. Of course, now, this is an adult writing, a speaker of our poem, writing or speaking in the poem, right? And so he says it out loud, second stanza. I can't remember the tale. What tale, right? The tale that the dad was telling. I can't remember the tale, but hear his voice still. You kind of get a sense that the father is now what? Right, now gone, right? So he's remembering back to the voice of his father telling the story. What was the voice like? Notice the next, the next line. A well of dark water. It's an interesting word picture. If you've ever looked down in a well and you see the black dark water down at the bottom of the well and it kind of can freak you out a little bit. A prayer. Now, of course, this idea of the prayer is significant because you've got open palms. And, of course, in many religious traditions, when you pray, you actually open your palms to deity or to uh, some kind of uh, spiritual um, personage. 
and I recall his hands. It's significant that in the first stanza, he tells us he doesn't look at the blade. He's kind of freaked out. And so all he can do is just listen to the story. I recall his hands, two measures of tenderness he laid against my face, showing the soft side of his father. But about, look at the next line, about his hands, the flames of discipline he raised above my head which tells us there's another side to his father that is somewhat maybe more complicated where he remembers that his father could be both a very gentle person but also he was a very strong disciplinarian. Maybe the child um, met the discipline of those hands. Some of you will jump to 3A really quickly if you know there's a country song of a number of years ago about uh, my daddy's hands, my recollection is. And uh, it's built off of something very similar. The next stanza is an interesting one because it invites you, the reader, into the poem. Had you entered that afternoon, you would have thought you saw a man planting something in the boy's palm. He's working, meticulously working. A silver tear, a tiny flame. Of course, now we come back to the title, the gift. There's something the father is giving the son in the moment that he's taking the metal shard out of the son's hand. Jot down, what do you think it is? Because this is the genius of this poem. We don't come right out and say what the gift is. You have to infer it. What is it for you? What would you say it is? What did the father give to the son that he would qualify a gift? Had you followed that boy you would have arrived here. So notice the tense change from the past to now the very present where I bend over my wife's right hand. So here he is now working on his wife's hand. She's got a splinter. But notice the intimacy of this poem at 2B. It's almost as if Lee Young Lee reaches out to you, the reader, and says, hey, join me for this. He like pulls you into the poem. Look how he does it. Look how I shave her thumbnail down so carefully she feels no pain. Watch how I lift the splinter out. So in other words, it's almost like, and when I read this poem aloud, I have a tendency, as you probably even heard me write just then, slow my language down. Did you notice that? I kind of slow down. It's almost as if while you're reading it, you can see him literally taking the splinter out of his wife's thumb, probably using a what? We know it because he says he shaved out, right? He used a knife. In other words, the recapitulation, the repeating of what had transpired so many years prior. I was seven when my father took my hand like this. So it's like immediately it takes him back to another time. Now, at 3B, we can already begin to ask this question about you as juniors. Have you had an experience that has already taken you back to an earlier time in your life? When, for example, maybe you had a, you had a, a, you had a memory that you had totally forgotten. This happened to one of my juniors the other day because she is doing this kind of uh, internship at one of the elementary schools and she reported to the class. She walked into the, into the school and it hadn't occurred to her because, you know, she was hurrying to get there and it was the first time and blah, blah, blah. And so she's walking in. She walked into Eastside, which is where she went to school as a little girl. For the first time, she said, I walked in, I took like several steps and then it hit me. Oh, this is the school I was at when I was in kindergarten in first grade in second grade. And she said, the weirdest thing happened to me where I just kind of stood there and started looking around and taking it all in. And then it hit me, all those memories that I totally forgotten until I was in that moment. And then all of a sudden, there it is, back again. Right? We've had ball players who will report the same thing. Like, for example, a baseball player who hadn't been on a diamond to play. He's older now, but he hadn't been on that diamond to play since he was a little boy playing Little League. Uh, in, a, in a game outside of town. And all of a sudden he reported he got out of the car with his buddies, he got ready to walk onto the diamond to start warming up, and then it hit him. He had played here as a little kid, and, it, and it's like coming back. In other words, how life has this tendency to repeat, recapitulate. 
Only now, notice, he's going to play a little game with us. He says, I was seven when my father took my hand like this, and I did not hold that shard between my fingers and think, metal that will bury me, christen it little assassin, or going deep for my heart. This is all the kind of things that he thinks about now as he is an adult, as he is kind of making maybe even jokes. And I did not lift up my wound and cry, death visited here. In other words, wow, I could have died if only. In other words, when you're a child, you are not able to make jokes about the splinter. When you're a child, as we saw at the conclusion of the first stanza, he thought he was going to die. What did he do as a child? Now notice the genius of the poem. We go right back to the scene at seven. I did what a child does when he's given something to keep. And there, of course, is the title of the poem. I kissed my father. Now, that's level one. Let's jump to level 2A really quickly, and let's do a, an exegesis of this poem at the second level, the thematic level, and, of course, the rhetorical level. At the thematic level, or the message level, of course, you can jot down several major possible messages or themes. Some students have reported the coolest thing about this poem is that long after his father is gone, he can still remember his father's voice and the story that his father told. He can't remember a lot about the story, but he remembers the experience. There's that famous line, people don't, know how much, don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And there's this sense in this poem that he's reverentially remembering his father and what his father did. Another major message here is that as a child, he could not really appreciate all of the complexities of what was going on. All he did as a child was to respond the way children do. He kissed his dad and said, thanks. That was it, right? Maybe he didn't even say thanks, just kissed his dad. Finally, another major message, and it builds off of our title here, is what it is that is given in the poem. The father extracts the metal shard, but there's something that's given in the poem by the father to the son. And a, and a lot of my students have pointed out that probably what it, 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 the gift is here is just the gift of love, the gift of compassion, the gift of gentleness. And a father can give that to his son in this moment, and the son remembers it only years later when he's you know, doing something very similar. At 2B, the rhetorical level, the genius of this poem, of course, is that it is able to move from the past to the present and then back again to the past, making us have a new appreciation, of course, of the young man as a young man and then as an older, as an older man, but of course, making us appreciate the power of the father. Let's jump to level three really quickly. And let's try to relate to this title personally, beginning at 3A by asking about other texts that we're familiar with. And maybe we might ask this question, what is for you your favorite movie where some father does something for his son or his daughter that is compelling? Where some mother gives, to use the language of the poem, the gift? Do you have a text like that? Do you have a, um, do you have a text that maybe comes to mind about how you, you have to appreciate as a child when you're given things, but you cannot really appreciate that until many years later. You might jot down, because we'll do it in your senior year, uh, Wordsworth's classic, um, um, uh, The Rainbow. My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. At the very end of the poem, he says, the child is father of the man. In other words, there's something that kind of repeats out of childhood, into adulthood, and then back to childhood again. In another poem by Wordsworth called Tim Turn Abbey, um, he makes the observation that it is significant that we live lives of little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and love. Here, of course, we have one of those seemingly insignificant acts. It isn't just that the metal shard was taken out. It's that he kisses his father at the end because his father is shown in kindness. Of course, at 3B, this is a compelling series of questions we will now ask. What if for you are the moments in your life, looking back, where someone in your family or someone who is close to you 
as an adult, did something for you. That you just now that you're thinking about it go, wow, that was a gift. Can you jot down the three greatest gifts that have been given to you by those people who have raised you? I've sometimes had juniors that say, you know what, me and my old man and my, and my mom, we just don't get on anymore. I mean, it's just the nature of it. There's a lot of negative energy in my family. We yell, we scream. But someone, have you thought about this? Someone held you when you were a first day born. And someone had to take care of you. And someone had to provide for you. And somebody made sure that on the first day of school, you were ready to go to school and you had your stuff on, and you had your little lunchbox or whatever, somebody had to take care of you and make all those meals for you. When do you ever say thank you for that? When do you ever say to the people in your life who have taken care of you, thanks for the gift? Now, of course, the language that you use is yours. As children, of course, what do we do we, to show appreciation? We just give them a kiss. As an adult, what do we do? We sit down and we write a poem or we figure out some other way, or we kind of become the people who raised us in some ways. You become your mother, you become your father. You become, in moments of tenderness, the very tenderness and tenderness that you were shown as a young person, the repeating over and over again. Finally, and this is a really interesting question, watch this one. When was the last time that you gave a child the gift? Using the understanding of this poem. When was the last time there was some really freaked out kid and you were the kind of adult and you had to say, it's, it's fine, it's fine, it's all going to be all right. And you had to kind of show some compassion and you had to help them out in some way. Might have been in a coaching situation, might have been in a, uh, you know, in a work related situation.